And we are live. Welcome to The Awakening Educator. I'm Susan Andrian. And I'm Megan Sweet. And today um, we're really excited to have Stephanie Ryan here to join us. We'll be talking about how to do STEM at home and um, how Stephanie came about doing that. So um, Stephanie, if you could introduce yourself, that would be great. Yeah, I'm Stephanie Ryan, and I am a woman of many hats, so I have a lot of different things I do. Uh, one of the things I do is I write curricular materials and assessments. And in the pandemic, I started doing uh, activities for kids and parents at home during the pandemic. So that is what I've really jumped into lately. So I think that that's what we'll talk about a little bit today. Yeah, that's great. great. We're very excited to have you here and uh, hopefully members of our audience uh, on Facebook, we're live right now on Facebook and YouTube. And so if you have a question for Stephanie, we'd love for you to share with us so we can answer audience questions. Yeah, that'd be great. So I know when we when we talked before, you mentioned that you know during the pandemic, uh, you started seeing this need to help people understand how to do science at home. So maybe you could just share a little bit about how that came about and, and what you started to do. Definitely. Um, so during the pandemic, we pulled my son out of pre-K and I ended up teaching pre-K, which you would think that as a science educator, I could probably handle that, but no, <laughs> a little bit of a learning curve there where I felt mm. like I was trying to force school on him of where mm. we practice letters and writing and it just, it didn't feel right. And so I talked mm. to his preschool teacher about it and she said to me something that really clicked was that, oh, well, what are you doing with him? And I said, well, I mean, other than that, we're folding laundry, we're washing dishes, you know, making dinner. And she was like, these are all life skills that are really important. And pouring water from a big measuring cup to a little measuring cup helps them see the different sizes of things. Um, and she was like, and helping in the garden, you learn about plants and the life cycle. She just, she pointed out all this stuff that I was like, totally not thinking about. I was just thinking, oh, ABCs, learn your name and things like that. But she highlighted something for me that if I'm having this much trouble as a science educator, I bet other parents are having trouble too. Um, and the least I could do during this is if I'm doing all these activities with my son, I could videotape them and give people some pointers. So uh, the Instagram account kind of took off and TikTok, they both did of where people ask me questions about videos and um, like, what kind of question do I ask my child after they do this? And so I found that that's something people were really looking for. Well, you know, yeah, I, mean, I, I don't know when you started the videos. Did you start them right away into the pandemic or did you do them a little bit later? Um, I think I started at the end of the summer. So we had been okay. in pandemic for a little while and we thought it was going to end and then it didn't. <laughs> I was going to say that I noticed a lot of people, especially right in the beginning, were really hungry for it. Um, and actually, mm -hmm. I think it is it's, a, it's the perfect timing around. Um, what you notice, which is it's actually really hard to teach our kids at home. I think most parents realize that pretty quickly. Um, and a lot of parents were really voracious around, you know, looking for, for that support and ways to make the learning feel a little bit more, yeah, supported and um, accessible for their kids. I mean, I'm, I'm an educator too, and I really struggled this whole year myself with mm -hmm. my kid uh, making learning relevant and, you know, I don't, I don't know that I was too successful. Uh, so I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, so that's cool. So it started with you just doing these videos with your son. So is he in all of them then? Is he like your, your sidekick in all of them? He's in a lot of them. Um, there are some that I'll do when he's taking a nap or something so that you get a better video of it. <laughs> Otherwise, he's like, the time lapse ones are always really funny because he's like running around and you can see that he's just like always moving. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think yeah. it's interesting how so many of us as educators and professionals had these separate lives of our, our children and school and we would drop them off. And one of the things I think the pandemic really did is, is bring us all together in a way that um, it forced us and somewhat to rethink what how we were spending time together. Um, but, uh, you know, it made us all more human, I feel like. Having your son running around in the background as you're doing these videos, even on the ones that he's not there, 
it kind of brings to life the reality of what it means to to do science with a little guy running around. Yeah, and one of the things that I noticed, um, I have a friend who I graduated college with. She would message me every once in a while, like, please tell me that you just sometimes sit and put him in front of the TV and have a cup of coffee. And I was like, yes, of course I do. And I was like, oh no, I'm coming across as a Pinterest person and that's not what my intent was. So I actually started showing some of my bloopers of where things don't work. So like I accidentally put too much baking soda in and the balloon pops off and stuff like that to show parents that, hey, I'm in the kitchen right now. I don't have all my equipment to accurately measure everything. <laughs> and I didn't get it right either. <laughs> I love oh, that you do yeah, that. <laughs> I spend a lot of time working because I work with parents and with kids as a, and myself just have experienced this, that compare and despair can be so painful for parents. And so providing that, you know, grounding and yeah, we do these great things, but it's not always like, you know, roses and, and right. tulips around here. There's there's other things going on as well. Um, so I appreciate that. What? How were you able to translate all? Because it, it see if I remember correctly, you wrote curriculum for K through 12 type schools. Mm -hmm. How were you able to translate some of those skills that you had in terms of curriculum development to mm -hmm. at home to working? You know, to bring it down to a preschool level that was more accessible for parents who may not be scientists. That's something that I think I've always kind of done. Um, so when I wrote my dissertation, I made sure that my parents who are not scientists, well, my dad's an engineer, so I had to kind of pretend he mm -hmm. didn't know the chemistry, but my mom and my sister and everybody, when I did my presentation, I wanted to make sure that someone who is not a scientist would understand. Um, because that's the whole point of science is sharing it with the public. And if you mm -hmm. can't talk to the public, that's a problem. So I always try to break concepts down anyway to help explain them and then build upon it. So I think mm -hmm. I already do that a lot with my son. Um, but yeah, there were some things that I would try and people would still look at me just like deer in headlights. And I'm like, okay, I need to take it back one more step, you know, um, and then build upon it. And people have, I've had a couple parents reach out to me and say like, wow, I feel empowered now. This is great. And it's like, I'm so glad you feel empowered. And I'm sad that you didn't before. Um, we've kind of killed that spirit in, <laughs> in school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I think I love that you said that. I mean, I, when I wrote my dissertation, um, that was one of the one of the things that one of my dissertation chairs would slap my wrist on all the time, which was like, no five dollar words. Make sure you know get rid of all of, in my case, education ease. So you know all that kind of insider language, really making sure it's accessible to other people. And I think that really helps. The other thing I heard you saying you did was you did some trial and error, which basically means like you tried it. If it wasn't super easy or clear for folks to be able to understand, um, you would do it again and again, showing the bloopers too, just really making it accessible. Um, you know, I think something that has been true this year, and I'm just wondering what the feedback has been from your audience, is you know, parents are suddenly teaching for the first time, and um, mm -hmm. they didn't have to do that before. They didn't have to, to interact with their children in that way, as Susan said. They didn't have to put themselves out there like that. They didn't have to try and figure out this content, and suddenly. Now they have to do all of that. I'm just wondering um, how you feel like the the parents or the community that have been to re going to your 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 science lessons. How have you watched them evolve over the last year? Have you watched them become more confident? Uh, you said that some of them felt a little bit better, but have you? How has your audience or the way that they've interacted with you evolved as mm -hmm. the year has gone on? Um, I've done a lot of parenting podcasts where they'll have me also do a demonstration that I share with people. So for Chronicles of Nania, I know I did a live for them and there have been a few, but what I see is I actually see the parent with the kid and I can see them doing this. And then the kid's like, wow. And the parent's like, oh, wow, this isn't quite what I thought it was going to be like. Like, this is a little easier than I was thinking. Um, and that it was all in my kitchen. Um but then I also see like on Instagram in terms of the same people liking things or leaving comments, you see some mm -hmm. people who you've never seen before commenting on things like, oh, I tried this, it was great. Or on TikTok, they do that one, what is it, duet, where it's like their video next to your video. And uh, I've seen yeah. some of those. And that's so cool that people are feeling that confident that they take the experiment they just saw and tried to do it immediately. Like that's so fun. 
Yeah, that's that really, really cool. is fun. Like that, it's just, and to see in real time your impact on that family, and and I'm curious, are they they seem are they joyful? Those side by side videos. Yeah, so far I I do <laughs> I do worry what I've opened myself up to by allowing that. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's really cool. Um, it's already time for our first commercial break. And maybe when we come back from our break, um, we can talk a little bit about just this accessibility of science. I'd love to talk with you about how we can bring science into more people. So we'll be right back. Susan. What were you saying? Your name. Oh, right. I don't know how that to. <laughs> I probably. And we're back. Welcome everyone back to the show. Um, when we went on break, we thought we'd come back and talk a little bit about how to make science more accessible beyond, I think you've done a big step there, but as a scientist, um, and there's a lot of misinformation out there. I mean, I, I, I hate to be too political, but I'm going to go there a little bit, which, you know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people that are, um, you know, wondering about, you know, is, you know, global warming a real thing? Do we have some real issues? You know, so I think to me as an educator, a career educator, I see those as examples of people not actually accessing content or not being aware enough. Um, so I'm just wondering from your point of view, um, yeah, uh, where's, what's the next step in science? I think that you're absolutely right. I noticed it during the pandemic um, of where, oh, see, they came up with new information, which means they lied. And it's like, that's not right. how, we don't really show how science is. Um, right. We present science as book of facts and that's it. And when I remember when I was in school, I never thought of science as something that was evolving, um, mm -hmm. that was ever changing or people were doing it now. Um, I didn't really think of it that way. And so I think that having kids do experiments that test their own ideas, like let's say you give your kids a challenge this summer to build a solar oven using a pizza box to melt chocolate and a marshmallow to make a s'more. Right. That has a lot of wiggle room for them to do things. They can do research, they can build it, they can test it, and then they can see what comes of it, and then they can make a claim from it. And by doing things like this, even younger, we're going to be able to have fewer people coming out of school thinking things like this, I think. <laughs> no, it's, it's, so, it's so funny, as you were talking to the 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 stuff that we were doing in school and some of the memories that I have with my kids who are now in high school. Um, so many of the big projects that we did were this is yearly science fair projects and uh, how, what an emotional ro roller coaster it was doing that with my daughter in particular, who, who just has a lot of fierceness in her. Um, but that, that experience of, testing like you're talking about like having a theory testing it and you're right i also did not get the sense that science was evolving i got the sense when i was a kid that what was being presented were were hard facts although some of the some of them were presented as theories it still did feel like it wasn't an interactive experience in the same way um so i'm, I'm curious uh, back to Megan's question about how we've politicized science. How do we get, how do we get back to a place where um, the understanding of science as a exploratory evolving opportunity for us to engage in growing and learning can happen? I'm, I'm curious what you think about that. Yeah, that's like before, before all the answers. problems. Uh, Susan, Susan, your name's still spelled wrong. Oh my gosh. 
<laughs> All right. Well, I guess to type it for you, but I'm, I couldn't, I can't <laughs> hand, handle it. So I'm just going to interrupt and say right. your name. <laughs> but Stephanie, it's please saying, answer the question. Is I've just it's been like, a, like Stephanie's the name on the is, Stephanie's Yours name is, is wrong. Mine is wrong. All right. You're a co host. I'm a coo-hoos. <laughs> well, that's a cool thing, isn't it? No, but we're going to be editing all of this out. I'm going to edit my name. Are we? I'm going to edit this episode and keep it all well, <laughs> Coo-hoos. Anyway, Stephanie, please answer the question. Just, yeah, it's around the politicization. So of I think that one of the things that is happening and needs to happen, continue to happen, is the transparency of science, publishing data sets, having scientists talk to the public about their research in the not $5 word terms, but in yeah. a public way um, and showing how they got to where they got. So it doesn't just look like hand waving, like, oh, look, here's the science I did and here's what I think, you know, um, and just showing all the work that went into it, how long, pointing out bias, like who funded your project, like super transparent. Um, yeah. And then the other thing that needs to happen is that we need to show better representation in science too. So mm -hmm. I know that there are a lot of Instagram accounts that are really good about this of where they, um, they have you guys done the, um, what does a scientist look like draw a scientist test before? Mm -mm. It's a test that they started doing in the 80s, and it used to be people would only draw old white men in a lab coat with glasses and with crazy hair. Right. Um, and over time, they've been seeing that people aren't drawing that anymore. They're starting to sometimes draw themselves or they'll draw something else, but not always themselves. And this, uh, these groups, they show scientists in their natural habitats. Like it's you are, there's some pink haired scientists, scientists with tattoos and from all different um, ethnicities and groups. And it's just great. And so to show the kids that everybody can do science, it's not just for the elite or the white men. Um, and that to be transparent with what everybody's doing with it. Because I mean, the science has a bad rap in the past for good reason. Um, and so they need to make sure that they're not, that fear needs to be put at ease in some people. So I think that that's a fair. <laughs> it's like scientists reputation getting a makeover. <laughs> well, yeah, I, mean, I think that's a really, I think you made two really, really powerful that's points. The first one, you know, when you were talking about making it accessible, I've, I've been getting a kick out of seeing Bill Nye, the science guy, is now just like Bill Nye. And he is speaking, uh, he's often being interviewed by, you know, pretty well-known establishments to talk about climate change, things like that. Um, so he's not doing the goofy stuff anymore. Um, but he started from those origins of being this guy that brought science to kids. And now he's still talking in an accessible and clear way mm -hmm. uh, to others, which for me is really exciting. I think also your point around, um, Helping, you know, representation really matters. Being it able really to see matters. yourself um, in in folks um, makes a really big difference. Um, gen by gender, by you know, race, ethnicity, um, you know, looking different ways. That you're right. It's not just a, a certain kind of person that science is available to. Well, and so yeah, economic yeah. status as well. Yeah. So yeah. that's where um, when you mentioned that you wanted to talk about accessibility to everybody, um, that is the materials. And so that's something I've thought about a lot is that anything I do needs to be something that everybody can have access to, to do in their kitchen, to show that chemistry is everywhere. Oh, I love that. I mean, let's maybe we can talk about that, too. Yeah, I was just going to. I was thinking, um, my little sister's a, a mathematician. She's not little, she's in her forties, but she's, she's still five to me. And, um, <laughs> and she hits those walls all the time. So I think in a lot of these fields that have, have been, you know, male identified, uh, white, my, white male identified, uh, historically, she still, she still hits it all the time. Like I was talking her down just yesterday. It's challenging, right? Because you, you have to, 
establish yourself. So there are a lot of people like my sister and you and others that are showing and kind of demystifying that there are actually women and different people in these fields. And I also just want to name it can still feel a little bit challenging sometimes for folks. Um, but yeah, let's talk about that. So you not only do you do these science projects um, and make them accessible in terms of terminology and language, you also make them accessible in terms of materials. So maybe you can speak a little bit about how you use your science projects in that way. Yeah. So like I said, we started doing a lot of these in the pandemic. And during the pandemic, uh, we were not going to grocery stores. And so we were using things that were inside our house or something that we could get delivered when we did have a grocery order. And that leaves things like oil and water and vinegar and baking soda and things you've just got in your house. And what could I do with all of those to teach basic things? And so I just made a list and I'm still kind of making a list. I have an idea for a, a workbook for kids um, with just baking soda and vinegar and oil um, of working with that. But um, yeah, it just, it, parents really appreciated that there was, they didn't have to go to the store and buy a kit. Right. They didn't need to go get anything. And in all of the lives I've done with these, um, like on Facebook Live or on Zoom, um, there's always somebody who doesn't have something. And that's fine. And we come up with a new way. So we did one where we did baking soda and vinegar in a bottle. And it released carbon dioxide. And there was a balloon on top. And the balloon blew up to show that there's a gas. Really simple. One group didn't have a balloon and they're like, wait, I have a rubber glove and they rubber banded a rubber glove. And then there was a hand on top. And it was like, yeah. that's fine. We can do this with lots right. of different stuff. It doesn't need to be exactly like mine. And that's the point is that this is something that we need to be able to make work in lots of contexts. Oh, wow, that's so cool. That's really fun. This is like, I, it is. I can just picture it right now with the kids and, um, even with the hand, almost like that, the, that unintended playfulness of it. Yeah, uh, I actually told the dad, because he was a little embarrassed he didn't have a balloon. And I said, well, this is better. I actually might change my activity to be a rubber glove. And you can use a balloon if you don't have a glove. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. it looked really cool with the hand popping up. Yeah, this is really neat. I mean, I think, and, and, I, and I think showing parents how to do that. Um, so now that we're coming back out of the pandemic, what's what's next for you and the work that you're doing? Um, where are we heading? That's a great question. Uh, now that my son is back at school, my days have opened up again and I can start working full time again. So I'm looking forward to curricular materials and assessments um, and writing maybe another book. But I definitely like putting up videos on TikTok and Instagram for people because it's just so cool that like 1.6 million people are watching a science video, like oh, while wow. they're sitting there scrolling. Wow. Like, that's so neat. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a huge, that's a huge number. That's stuff. a big audience. <laughs> well, that yeah. was just the one that went viral. Yeah. <laughs> the others haven't went that high, but it, the first one that's went silly. viral. And it was crazy because every day I'd get messages and I'm just like, this is science going viral how fun is right. that <laughs> but, it, but it's something that they i think what you you keyed into was it isn't just something that folks were watching it was something that they were engaging in and doing together and so it was this participatory thing that caught at a time that folks needed it um were looking for things to do with their kids that were accessible i'm curious how this whole experience is going to change the way you write curricular yeah it might <laughs> I know that when I'm writing assessment items, I have been kind of switching more toward oil and water and things like that instead of like a chemical. Um, well, they're all chemicals, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> instead yeah. of something more complicated. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I know that during the pandemic, I worked on a lab manual for the American Chemical Society, and we were having a webinar about what can you do the labs at home? So I went through the lab manual, like which of these could we do at home and which ones can't you and what could maybe we do instead? And there were a few people who were on the webinar, like really concerned that we weren't doing what's normal in the lab. And it's like, well, this isn't normal. Like <laughs> this right. is not normal for any of us. Like, can we get the point across with baking soda and vinegar? The answer is yes, you really can. You do not need those other things. Yeah, they're great and they help teach other concepts in chemistry, but 
if you really are just trying to teach conservation of matter, you can do that um, with baking soda and vinegar. So I think it gave a lot of the a lot of the universities and schools a look into the inside of kids' lives for mm -hmm. one, because they didn't know some of the backgrounds of what they had and what they didn't have. So I think it it normalized the assumption that people might not have that at home. Um, and I think that that's a good place to move forward, that maybe we take a look at it and make it more accessible all the time. Maybe we put our our labs and lectures online all the time so that they're asynchronous so people who work the night shift can do it and they don't have to miss class. Like there's just a lot of really, I, I hate to say that that's a good thing that came of it because the pandemic was not good for so many, but that's something that came out of it that I don't think people would have thought about otherwise. Yeah. yeah well, Megan and I through the out the pandemic have been saying, how are we going to emerge from this better than we came in? And so asking that question, I think, isn't the same as saying, oh, it was worth it. It was really hard. It was really <laughs> awful. But I do think it's important to recognize the evolution, the, the leap forward that we can also make in terms of we can do a lot more better. We have to do a lot more better. And this seems like an area, just as you were saying, making it more accessible. Folks who are working the night to have ways that uh, making curriculum and learning more accessible to, to folks that have been locked out historically. I'm wondering how it feels to you. I mean, I, I'm yes to all that. And <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm doing, I'm changing the subject now. Go yes, for thank it. You, Susan. That was right. Um, I think the accessibility is important. Sorry. I'm not trying to diminish what you're saying, Susan. Um, I guess I'm just wondering how your sense of self maybe has changed or who you are, what your capacity, you know, what's possible for you. Um, I mean, I think it's one of those things we hear about a lot, but you know, we actually have someone whose video went viral. Um, yeah. So I would just love uh, to hear from you how your sense of self or what, what feels possible has changed since doing this this year. That is such a deep question <laughs> and coming out of the pandemic, it's something I've been really grasping to figure out what it is. Um, when it first started happening, I was a little embarrassed that like, what do you do? I'm an Instagrammer. Like that's kind of how I felt a little bit because I wasn't doing my normal work and I felt like it was something that wasn't what I was meant to do. Um, and then as it took off more, I actually feel I, I'm hitting a stride with it. I really like, I like going on podcasts. I like going on television to do news and show experiments to people. I love getting the word out there. So I think it strengthened my identity as a public science communicator. Um, but in terms of everything else, I'm still working on that. But it made me feel a lot better as a mom that I was like, mm -hmm. I handled a pandemic with a four-year-old. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, that's no handled the pandemic, Stephanie. You threw down. <laughs> yeah, there's no handling here. This was uh, serious. So yeah, that's really cool. Um, we're already at our next break. So maybe when we come back, we can talk a little bit about yeah, what's next or what are some other ways that we can start thinking about bringing science in in a real intentional way to our communities. So we'll be right Great. back. Mm -hmm. Welcome back. back. Oh, sorry, Susan. Go, go ahead. for it. Do it. Go for it, Megan. No, go. go for it. Go, Susan, go. Okay. <laughs> Welcome back. To the, we're the, I'm going to edit all that out. Um, welcome back to the Awakening Educator. We are with, here with Stephanie Ryan talking about making uh, science accessible during the pandemic and her Instagram, uh, her Instagram show. Is it a show or? Uh, no, it's just daily posts. Daily posts. <laughs> daily, uh, just daily. Holy just cow. Daily. Uh, bringing science uh, at home accessible to all kids and families. Um, and it's there's been a growing audience that we're hearing about and just a joy of science that families are bringing into their household. Um, before we went on the break, Megan was asking Stephanie about how this has changed her. Um, and we were going to talk about what we're... <laughs> I'm really got to do a lot oh, of editing. I'm so up. glad you brought us back, Susan. It's awesome. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, like, Stephanie. Usually I'm much better than this. Today I'm uh, like... Totally fine. It's Friday you're evening, awesome. guys. It's Friday. <laughs> Um, no, you're. I mean, you're right. So I think it's really cool. I, I was gonna, I was gonna bring us back with, with an Instagram sensation. Um, uh, that's what Stephanie yeah. is. 
Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about how to bring science back, but actually it'd be great stuff to hear about your book because you did write and publish a book in the middle of all of this as well, correct? So not only were you with home with a four-year-old, I mean, she didn't like, she like smashed, <laughs> smashed she, you know, the, pandemic. Pandemic. the pandemic in shelter in place and just kicked it right in the rear. So um, <laughs> daily Instagram posts, uh, doing education with her four-year-old, and then you wrote a book. So maybe you can talk to us a little bit about your book. Um, it makes yeah, me really so bad that we get out to walk every day because that's that was <laughs> the my book level. came out in the pandemic. I actually okay. wrote it the year prior, um, so okay. it was already ready to go, <laughs> and luckily printed before that because that would have been a real problem. Mm. Um, so I wrote this book, and like I've said throughout the podcast, I have definitely always really liked breaking concepts down for other people. And I was working on, I don't know, some concept I needed to break down for the work I do. And I watched my son play at toys at the same time, you know, you like kind of monitor. <laughs> and so I was doing that and he was sorting his toys by color. And I was like, wait a second, if he can sort at this age, he could, we could have a chemistry book. <laughs> Like, because wow. you swear a lot of things in chemistry. It's atoms or molecules, pure substances or mixtures, and you've got solids, liquids, or gases, chemical or physical change. And I was like, I think we could do this. So I sat down, I hammered out several subject areas. So I have other book ideas. Um, and I made PowerPoint slides at the time because I didn't know what to do. Um, and then I ended up doing a Kickstarter to get the book published. Um, so it was successfully funded. And then it got released during the pandemic, June 2nd. It was actually, um, I think it was Blackout Tuesday. So everything was closed and closed. So super closed. <laughs> um, right. And we weren't sure what to do because it's like, how do you go live with a book when there are no bookstores open? So um, it was it was tricky. So I'm just really glad to have gained the momentum we did. But the book itself is really fun. Um, it is about four kids, one of them being my son, Charlie, right there. And then mm -hmm. his three best friends at the time of when I wrote this. And they play a game of which of these things is not like the other. And they use their favorite toys. And that is something that was the biggest important part of this book was that this is things that kids are used to seeing every day and they can identify chemistry concepts with it. So like I've got a baseball, a doll, blocks, and a carton of milk. These are things kids see every day at school or preschool. And they can say like, what's the difference between, which one doesn't match? And sometimes people will say, oh, the, like little kids will say, oh, well, you can drink milk and you can't drink the others. And it's like, that's fine. That is a correct response. You justified your claim with evidence, which is all I needed you to do. And then you can skip the next page if you don't think your kid's ready for it. Or you can go into it and say that the baseball, the blocks, and the doll are all solids. Can you think of a solid at your house? Um, and going like that. So it's been really fun because I see some people have done their own projects with the book of where they'll put four things together and do their own classification. And that's been fun to see pictures of too. Yeah, I love that. Oh, wow. I mean, who hasn't played that game with their children when they were little? Or, you know, I just remember Sesame Street. Um, that being a big part of Sesame Street and that, that being able to, game in Sesame Street. I know it really was, there were so many great things in Sesame Street, but it, it, um, that idea of taking that and then linking it specifically to chemistry and linking it to these, uh, these deeper concepts. And I, I really feel like that scaffolding is what teachers do all the time, mm -hmm. but to be able to bring it home and to bring it to the family and help scaffold that for parents so that they can do it with preschoolers um, and, and early childhood, you know, kindergarten, first grade. It's really, a, what a brilliant idea to, to bring that. And I'm, I'm wondering what has been the response of the community? What have been some of the things that you've heard from, from folks who have bought your book? Yeah, they've really enjoyed it. I've heard a lot of parents thought it was fun to be able to do experiments along with the book, and they appreciated that. Um, I get pictures of kids reading it. They like it as a bedtime story, which that one surprised me. Um, but apparently the pictures are inviting enough that they really like to like play with the books. Um, that's my favorite part of all of this is when people instant message me a picture of their kid reading my book. It just 
warms my heart every time. <laughs> and did you do um, the art or did you work with an artist? I worked with an illustrator. With yeah. an illustrator. Yep. Great. Well, I, I know two girls that are three years old that would probably love that book. So I'll have to go out and get it myself. <laughs> um, their mom's a scientist, so I'm sure she'll be happy about that as well. So, um, yeah, I, I just want to thank you for coming on, Stephanie. We're just about at the end of the show. And um, I just really appreciate so much of what you brought forward. You know, number one, uh, just making it really accessible, making science accessible to everyone. Um, both in your language, but also in your approach, uh, making it affordable. Um, so making sure that science is something that people know they can do at home, um, making it equitable in terms of like really making sure that people understand that everyone can be a scientist and science is something that is not relegated to any one person or identity or, or background. Um, and just making it fun. You have such a, obviously such a passion for the work that you do. Um, and, what great timing. I know, I'm sure it was probably, it felt like a setback before <laughs> to become an Instagram sensation while publishing a book is kind of like the dream. So mm -hmm. um, that's just really exciting that, that uh, this is all coming together. And I can't imagine uh, a better, kinder person to have so many wonderful things. Oh, happening. you're so, so nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and really looking forward to the next books that are coming out. Sounds like you have your concepts, so you, you're ready to bring more. So it sounds like this is the beginning of a journey. Uh, for you as both an, a children's author and really making science accessible, continuing yeah. to bring that vision and mission to the world. So it's great. It's exciting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Stephanie. Thanks for joining us. And thanks for having me. Uh, are, are we going to do the spotlight? Oh, shoot. Ah, oh, spotlight. Spotlight. So now we're now we're transitioning to the spotlight. So thank you, Stephanie. The last part of the show is absolutely the spotlight. You're really getting us on prime form. You're getting now. us on our not our prime. And all right. Wow. I'm all this about showing how it's really working. So this is, this in, is in great. my defense, the spotlight is still new. Um, we've only done it about four times. So um that's going to be my excuse. All right, Susan, you want to cue us up for this? Yeah. So uh, today's spotlight in partner in keeping with the theme of science and STEAM, this is about a STEAM lab at a high school and some really cool things that they're doing. So I'm just going to play this for us. It's a little longer than most of our usual ones, and I but I felt like it was a great link to what we're doing. Ooh. Cool. Uh, can you, I gotta do the hearing, oh goodness. Okay, I just lost it. <laughs> we're not gonna do this right now. We're I lost not gonna it. do it right now, okay. Um, so we're not gonna do the science one, so we will wrap